Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this quarter's Charm Cassini Telecon. My name is Joe Pateski. I'm a member of the Project Flight team, and today we have a very special presentation. Charm prides itself on giving access to recent science results, and you can't really get any more recent than something that was just presented to Cassini's Project Science Group less than a fortnight ago, a two-day workshop that our speaker will be telling you about in highly condensed and highly enjoyable form. So I'd like to first introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I'd like to remind people, please do mute your phone because it's very easy, of course, to get distracted by a dog or something else, and we do appreciate the ability to hear our speaker clearly. Today's speaker, Dr. Connor Nixon, is a space scientist working in the Planetary Systems Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. He is the Deputy Principal Investigator on Cassini's Composite Infrared Spectrometer, which we refer to as SEERS. And he first joined the SEERS team actually in graduate school, where he is one of the people who's really been cradled to grave on this mission. He actually helped to build and test the actual instrument. Connor studied science in the United Kingdom at Oxford and Cambridge Universities after growing up and attending school in Belfast, Northern Ireland, as you will hear from his somewhat distinctive accent. His research interests include studying the chemical compositions of the atmospheres of Titan and Jupiter, along with developing future instruments and missions to explore the outer solar system. And after hearing this talk, you will no doubt want to follow him on Twitter, indeed possibly even join Twitter so you can follow him at Sham Rocketeer. So, Connor, it's all yours. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Joe. Uh, that's a great introduction. And I'm really excited to be uh, talking today on this Charm Telecom. In fact, as Joe said, I've been on the Cassini mission since graduate school, and that's, oh, 20 years now. So it's been my entire career, but this is actually my first Charm Telecom. So for that reason, I'm especially excited to be giving this one today and uh, thank everyone for, uh, for calling in. So in fact, as Joe said, this uh, talk, which I'm giving today on Titan cold case files, was very recent science that was presented just two weeks ago at a workshop of the Cassini Project Science Group. And that's when we get all the Cassini scientists together on the entire mission from all the different uh, instruments on the spacecraft. <clears throat> and we get together to discuss forthcoming uh, science planning, but also to discuss results. And in the last, <clears throat> in the meeting we had two weeks ago, we decided to go back and examine these cold case files. So these are topics that have been opened up very early in the mission there. They include things that were expectations going into the Cassini mission and things that we found very early on that were surprising. <clears throat> some of these got solved. Some of them were not solved. Some of them were put on a back burner. So we decided to do a, a roundup of all the things that we, were, that we still had in these cases and see if we could uh, determine if they were still open or closed. <clears throat> so. This uh, meeting, as I said, was held about two weeks ago. And uh, as well as just uh, looking at these science cases, we also want to generate discussion between the other, between the various scientists on the team who don't always get together and see if by combining data from different instruments, we can actually get a break in some of these uh, cases. <clears throat> so the 12 cases that I've selected here are, are listed here, and my plan is to go through these uh, one at a time, give you a very brief uh, couple of minutes uh, summary as to what, what is the motivating question here? What, what, is, the, what is the mystery? <clears throat> what is the evidence? What is the initial evidence that maybe caused us to be confused, perplexed? And then was there later evidence that came during the mission from Cassini that enabled us to solve it? Do we think it's not a, uh, a partially solved case? Or is it really still a complete mystery that's going to have to await for another uh, mission to come along and, and uh, solve it with uh, different instruments? And so I'm going to go through these 12 cases. Then at the end of that, I'll take any questions that you have. You can uh, fire away, ask me whatever questions you want. I'll do my best to answer. And then if we have time at the end, I want to show you something else, which is another <clears throat> uh, project I was working on over the last couple of years with some student interns. And we created a very short, fun uh, educational video about Titan, which 
some of you may be able to, to use in your uh, schools, classrooms, museums, or uh, just uh, show, show your friends and family. And uh, we're going to take a look at that at the end, and hopefully that'll be a little bit of a uh, little bit of fun. So let's kick it off with Titan's case number one, which I'm calling the wobbly spinning top. So Titan, like many of the moons in the solar system, over time becomes tidally locked to its parent body. In, in this case, that's Saturn. What that means is that just as the, the moon of the Earth keeps its uh, one face towards the Earth at all times, we also expect that uh, Titan is uh, tidally locked to Saturn. So Titan goes around Saturn in about 16 days. And during that time, it does one rotation. So it keeps the same face at all times, uh, mostly towards Saturn. But, you know, we don't want to just take anyone's word for it. We want to check these things. And Titan, because it has this atmosphere surrounding it, is a little more difficult to, uh, to check that than it would be if you were looking at one of the other moons that has no atmosphere, such as, uh, you know, Mimas or Enceladus or Tethys or Rhea. So we have to be able to see down to the surface and track those surface features and see if those surface features are going around in a 16-day period. Unfortunately, Cassini carries on board a very capable radar system, and this radar system is able to see right down to the surface, and we're able to then look at features on the surface and see if they reappear 16 days later in the exact same place or not. And in fact, early on in the mission, back in 2008, when we looked at these features, lo and behold, they appeared to be moving. Wow. So they're not coming back to the same place at the same time. Titan seems to be wobbling or maybe speeding up. What's going on here? What could be causing that? Well, part of the, uh, part of the problem turned out to be a little bit of user error that we had a uh, glitchy computer program, which was not making all the necessary adjustments. So this is actually a great lesson in science that you go back and you check things and recheck things. And after fixing the problem, we determined that the surface features do appear mostly where we expect. However, once we really get into the details here, we can see that there is some detailed movement of Titan. <laughs> and you can see these two plots I've shown you here. The, uh, the first plot, this shows uh, the, what we call the precession of uh, Titan's uh, <clears throat> spin pull and orbit pull, which are actually uh, wobbling with two different periods. One, a 700-year cycle caused due to the gravitational pull of Saturn, and also the 29.5-year uh, cycle of Saturn and Titan going around the Sun. So what this means is that over very long periods, Titan is wobbling just like you would see a spinning top, perhaps not standing up straight, but just wobbling with that uh, axis of rotation uh, processing around in a, in a circle. <clears throat> And in fact, these are exactly as we predict them to be. We haven't found anything that's different from what we predict. So right now we have the math, we have the tools, and we've explained this case, and it all really perfectly matches up with what we expect. So we're going to call this one, number one is now case closed. So we're going to move on to case number two, what's hiding inside of Titan? <clears throat> so one of the big questions is, what's Titan made up of? Is Titan a solid body? Does it have liquids inside? How does it compare to the other moons in the solar system? So from a long time ago, prior to Cassini, even prior to Voyager, we knew roughly what the density of Titan was. We knew roughly how big it was, and we knew roughly how much mass it was. And if we work that out, we get a density of about 1.8 grams per cubic centimeter. And uh, as you may know, water is around one, is exactly one gram per cubic centimeter. And a rock is about three times as heavy so we're talking about something that's right in the middle, around twice as much as water, but less than rock. So we're expecting that Titan is going to be roughly 50-50 rock and water ice, because those are the two main things that we can use as our building blocks to build up Titan. But we, what we don't know is, how is that material distributed inside? Is Titan still in a frozen state, like a cometary snowball, where we have ice with pockets of rock dotted throughout it? Or was it warm enough inside during its process of accretion and formation, that it was able to melt all the water, and the rock was able to uh, kind of fall downwards 
through the slush layer down to the bottom and accumulate at the bottom uh, in the core and have the ice and water on top. So in other words, it's tightened differentiated or undifferentiated are the technical terms we use. And the way we do that is we measure what's called the moment of inertia. And really, that's just the distribution of mass. Is the mass concentrated in the center, or is it spread evenly throughout? And we do that by using Cassini's uh, radio science equipment, which tracks Cassini's location really precisely as Cassini flies by Titan. And any deflections in Cassini's course due to Titan can be measured really precisely. And that will give us an idea as to where the mass is located, if it's centrally located or distributed. So what we find is that Titan's uh, moment of inertia factor is about 0 0.34, and that's just a number. And what that means is that it's uh, it's higher than Ganymede, which has a really differentiated interior, but it's lower than Callisto, that we believe uh, is undifferentiated, those, of course, being the two largest satellites of Jupiter. So we see that Titan is something in the middle, and that means Titan is probably partially differentiated. But there are a number of different models that could explain this in different ways. What we couldn't really be sure of was does that really mean that there's a liquid layer or no liquid layer? Because there's a couple of different models that fit. But in addition, we can measure something else. And this is the way Titan flexes, which means that it kind of um, squishes like one of those uh, balls that you would stretch at your desk if you were having a, a rough day. And Titan flexes a little bit. And when we measured that flexing, we could look to see whether it had zero flexing, like a solid ball, or if it had a lot of flexing, like a water balloon. That would be the maximum possible case. And in fact, Titan is in the middle. So it is flexing. And that indicates that Titan is not rigid. It's not completely uh, rock and absolutely frozen ice. It has to have some liquid layer that's going to allow the crust to flex back, back and forth a little bit. So in this case, we cracked it again. Titan does have a water ocean inside. And that's really great news, because that means that now Titan is a two ocean world. It has liquids inside. And as you'll hear about, also liquids on the surface, which are different. So we're moving from Titan's interior a little bit here to the uh, surface and the uh, interaction between the interior and the surface. So in this case, we're wondering, does, does Titan have active uh, tectonics or volcanism? So the Earth, of course, we know has its warm inside, and the rock magma comes up, and we have volcanoes. And there's one other place in the solar system we can be sure about, which is Io, which has uh, uh, rock volcanoes, and perhaps a couple of the uh, outer moons, such as uh, Triton and Pluto. But Titan we don't know about. And in particular, again, because we have this atmosphere in the way, it makes it much harder to tell. Why do we think there might actually be active volcanism? Well, one of the issues is that Titan, uh, Titan's atmosphere is supported by methane. And the methane is being destroyed by sunlight. And if you add up how much methane is in the atmosphere today, and you add up how much uh, sunlight is hitting it and destroying it, you find that there's uh, only about 1% of the methane uh, that, it, that it would take to last for the age of the solar system. In other words, the current solar flux will destroy all of Titan's methane in about 10 to 20 million years. So we think maybe there's methane leaking out of the interior. Maybe there's volcanoes. We have this wonderful early picture from the VIMS team in 2005 on the left here where they saw this bright icy feature, which they called the snail. And then there's a kind of a graphical depiction as to what that might look like. So we're wondering if maybe this has some kind of flow front features that would be like an erupting uh, volcano. But as time went on, more evidence was accumulated. And when the radar team went back and looked at this terrain, in fact, they found nothing strange at all. They couldn't see anything that looked like the uh, VIMS feature. And it just looked like totally flat, undifferentiated terrain. And there was nothing resembling a volcano. So, so in this case, we had to uh, send everyone uh, back, to the, back to the computers again. And over the course of the mission, scientists on many of Cassini's teams have looked really, really hard to see if we could find any other active volcanic features. And at this point, we still can't be sure. So I put a couple of examples here, the one on the left show some bright icy terrain, which we call um, uh, Tui Regio. And this looks icy, so it may be uh, something that's young that's maybe just erupted out of the interior. And on the right here, we have this really intriguing 3D visualization here of a feature that was mapped by the radar team. And it appears to be kind of a mountain peak, which you see towards the top of the picture, and then right beside it to the 
uh, to the left, there's kind of this deep hole. And these appear to be about one and a half kilometers in size, both the mountain and the, the, the hole beside it, which may be some kind of crater. So these are really the, the best candidates that we have right now for volcanism. But unless we see something actually erupting or changing, it's really hard to be sure if this is really active uh, volcanology or not, or maybe these are just artifacts that are left over from a long time ago. So in this case, we're going to call it uh, cases open. And it's a, this is actually perhaps the one of the biggest uh, cases that we have on Titan right now. This is something that was hypothesized going into the Cassini mission that we knew we were going to look for. And at this case, despite um, all the searching we've done, we haven't found anything right now that's really conclusive. So this is a really uh, this is one of the great reasons we have to go back to Titan. So in case number four, we're going to look at some of those icy features on the surface in a little more detail. And in this case, we're going to ask, do we see water ice on Titan's surface, right? So in case two, we said that Titan is partially differentiated, which means that the rock is mostly in the center and the water ice is mostly on the surface or the crust. But does that mean we can actually see water ice or not? So one of the uh, really interesting facts about Titan is that because it has this atmosphere, because it has this methane, there's a chemical environment which is going on all the time. And as the methane gets destroyed by sunlight, it gets turned into more dense, complicated hydrocarbons, which are really like petroleum or other types of uh, organic materials. And we know that these are going to come down on the surface and coat the surface. And these are probably going to obscure whatever ices are there. So the question comes down to, are there places on the surface where we can see water ice that would be indicative, perhaps, of the volcanology? Or is everything really just covered up and disguised by the organic material? And this map that I've put here, this is again from the DIMS team from early in the mission. And you can see really the diversity of terrain that's beginning to emerge on Titan. We can see some very dark regions. We can see some uh, brighter regions. We think the uh, darker regions are the more organic material, and the brighter regions are the icier material. But in terms of the detailed composition, we need something else to tell us what the composition is. And that tool is spectroscopy. So again, I've indicated a couple of the bright regions here. And when we look at Titan's spectrum, so really what we're doing here is we're just looking at the rainbow of different wavelengths of light, so different uh, colors of heat, as it were. And this shows uh, part of the VIM spectrum here for different regions on Titan. On a particular, uh, the red line here that I've shown is really indicative of a typical uh, Titan characteristic. Now, you can see that there are some uh, bumps showing up here at around uh, 2.8 and 5 uh, microns in wavelength. And in fact, these are places where we know that water ice is really strongly absorbing. So if there's water ice on the surface, these places should be dark. And in fact, they're reflective. So that indicates that there may be an ice there, but it may not be water ice. And it's been a really uh, difficult task to try and unravel is there a specific ice that could be causing this? Uh, at this point, we still don't have all the answers. <clears throat> but what we do know is that we haven't found anywhere that we can conclusively say that there is absolutely exposed water ice on the surface. So in this case, <clears throat> the case for the water ice is closed. We do not see water ice on Titan's surface. But what are the ices is still the open part of the question. OK, so we're going to move right along to number five. And this is uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of Titan. So uh, more than uh, 30 years ago, when people realized that Titan was producing all these chemicals in the atmosphere that were raining down on the surface, there was an immediate conclusion that there had to be lakes and pools of the more volatile chemicals. And in particular, the main material that methane gets turned into is a slightly heavier molecule called ethane. And the ethane, really, we know, must be filtering down through Titan's atmosphere and forming the droplets and then raining out on the surface. And the initial expectations were that if this process had really been going on for four and a half billion years, the Titan would be. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Yeah. Mr. Connor? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but I cannot understand you right now. Are you walking away from your microphone, maybe? Or? Uh, no, I'm right beside the phone. I'll, shall I just try and speak up a bit? Uh, you're all underwater here. Okay. Um, is this a good time to ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, all right. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the obvious thing for me is the timeline for Cassini. I'm, I, if you have already given it to us, I'm sorry I missed it. But um, I'm up here in New York State. Uh, we want to know what the timeline is for Cassini. We want to know what it's doing for the next few months and how long it's going to be there. I think that's a question we'll be able to address offline because that's something that is this particular charm is going to be focused on Titan results. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Okay, I can barely understand you, but you said you can't give it to us right now? The focus of the particular uh, telecon for today is just about Titan, as opposed to being an overview about the entire timeline of the mission. But okay. if you can give me your name, I can contact you afterwards, and we can hook you up with people who can give you those resources as well. Okay, I'm sorry. I My name is Tish Brzee. Okay. And I'm a system ambassador up here in Vestal, New York. At okay. At Observatory. And, yes, I'd love it if you could write to me. Sure. Okay, and um, <clears throat> Tish, I would also suggest that if you look at the Cassini website, there's a lot of information online about the Cassini mission. It's a really great uh, resource, but I'm sure if you can't find the information on there, somebody from the project, um, Joe or somebody else, would be really happy to help you find the information you're looking for. <clears throat> well, I hope, every, I hope everybody else can hear me and that maybe that's just a problem with the local line up there. So I'm going to keep going. Um, and uh, yeah, please uh, please interrupt me if there's any other uh, problems. But uh, for now, I want to I want to keep talking about these lakes and seas on Titan because the expectation right after the Voyager mission, which uh, was really the first close-up visitor to Titan back in 1980, was that Titan should be covered in really deep oceans of ethane. So this is one of the main reasons that Titan that Cassini carried a, a radar instrument was to be able to look at the surface and see what's going on there. So it took us a while, actually, to find any liquids on the surface at all, and this was really, really surprising result. So you have to remember, we thought the Titan would be absolutely uh, hundreds of meters deep in a global ocean of ethane that had been produced over the edge of the solar system. And in fact, what we found was some really big lakes on Titan's North Pole, which you see on the left here. Uh, very, very little in the south, just one lake, which looks a little bit different in the south. You can see there on the bottom of the southern hemisphere plot. But um, we didn't see these global oceans, and that was, uh, that was a real surprise. And we're going to come back to that in a later, in a later case. But for now, the, case that I want, the, the thing I want to examine here is why are these lakes in the north and not on the south? Because if you think about the Earth, it's not like we just see lakes in the northern hemisphere. Uh, not in the southern hemisphere. So we need something to explain this. And in fact, it turns out again, this is due to the orbit that Titan has going around Saturn and the orbit that Saturn has going around the Sun. So Saturn has an eccentric orbit. That means it's an oval orbit. It's not a circle. That means at certain points it's further from the Sun and at other points it's closer to the Sun. When it's further from the Sun, it's moving slower, according to Kepler's laws. And when it's uh, closer to the sun, it's moving faster. And what this means is that at the present time, when Titan is closer to the sun, that happens to be when it's uh, southern summer, when the southern hemisphere is tipped towards the sun. And that means that the southern summers are both shorter, but also more intense than the northern summers. And you can see that on the, on the plot number A that I've put there, which shows this uh, brighter uh, kind of white region around 270 on the x-axis, which is in the south. And you can see that the corresponding uh, time period in the north, around 45 uh, LS in the north, 
is not reflecting that. So I hope you can see that those two uh, contour brightnesses are not symmetric. So the southern summer, when it comes around to southern summer at 270, it's a lot brighter and hotter than it is in the north around 45. Um, but over time, this reverses, and there's about a 31,000-year cycle to that. And that means that if you go to the middle plot, you can see that these two brightnesses have now reversed. And now it's the north. When it comes to be summer, it's uh, hotter, and the southern summer is, is less hot. And what that means is the present day, the liquids are really just going to evaporate more rapidly in the south, and they're all going to uh, rain out in the north. And then when the northern summer comes around, it's not going to be as hot, and it's not going to evaporate all those liquids back to the south again. So it's going to be an asymmetry to the pattern of evaporation there. And on the extreme uh, right-hand side there, I show you that the uh, North Pole and South Pole, kind of the way the peak heating is um, from 100,000 years ago <clears throat> to the present day. And you can see that they've traded places a little bit, and that right now the South is that red line, and the South is in the ascendancy, so the southern uh, peak insulation is, uh, is hotter. And another wrinkle to this is that methane and ethane, which are two things that can both compose the lakes, the methane is about 10,000 times more easy to evaporate than the, than the ethane. So the methane is really going to move around, while the ethane is, is going to stay still. OK, so in this one, we have, we've cracked our case. Yay, case cracked. And we're going to look a little bit more detail about this ethane question on case six. So. We've kind of got this map now of the lakes. We have more lakes in the north. We have less lakes in the south. But we're still seeing vastly, vastly, vastly less lakes, less organic material on the surface than we would expect if Titans had this active photochemistry. It's almost like a giant chemical factory that's spewing out chemicals over four and a half billion years. And there's just not nearly enough uh, organic material on the surface to, to account for that. So in this kind of like bookkeeping game of accounting, someone is fiddling the books. There's 99% uh, there's <clears throat> of, our, of our carbon is, uh, is missing. So, so I put here that uh, Titan is producing about 15 million kilograms of ethane per day. If you add that up, we should be hundreds of meters deep in, in ethane, but we don't see that. One of the other organic materials on the surface we see, as well as these lakes and seas, are that we see these dune fields. And I hope you can see in this figure that I've put here, these linear uh, features going from the bottom left to the top right. And as they encounter these icy kind of hummocks, they appear to either be blown and divert around the hummocks, or in some cases, they just kind of come to a stop. And this shows us that we're seeing kind of longitudinal dunes here, which are very similar to the sand dunes that we see on the Earth, uh, particularly uh, Namibia has been held up as, as an, a comparison example. But in this case, we're seeing organic material, dry, flaky organic material, and it's wafting around on Titan due to the surface winds. But even if we add up all this organic material, uh, which is not even liquid, we still don't have enough organic material. So Titan's ethane must be going somewhere. Or is it? So one of the clues that we have is when we looked at Titan's poles, we found that Titan's poles are shrunken. So Titan is a little bit squished um, compared to uh, the poles are squished compared to the equator by about 300 meters. And one hypothesis, which is a really intriguing hypothesis, is that the ethane can be leaching into this water ice crust. And inside this crust, there are little cages. And these little cages, you can see in the lower right-hand side of this figure here, where I have these little red circles. And they're in these little cages of water ice. And this is methane. And what happens is that when the ethane, which is the uh, two black circles, the molecule that has the two black circles, comes down, it percolates inside these cages. We call these clathrate cages. And it pushes out the methane and displaces it and puts, puts itself in there. And that allows some methane both to come back into the atmosphere. And it also gives these tidy holes where the ethane can hide out in the crust. And this also means that the crust now becomes denser because it's got a heavier molecule than it did before. The crust is going to get denser. It's going to sink and subside a little bit under its own pressure. And that means that could explain the uh, fact that the poles are now squishing down because they're getting heavier compared to the equator. And in fact, we know that the rain is occurring at the poles. So that's a really um, great story if it works. Now, if we look at the squishing of the poles, we can account for perhaps about 300 million years up to 1,200 million years of ethane production. And that's about a quarter of the age of the solar system. So that gives us a pretty good uh, hypothesis 
that if ethane is only being produced for about a quarter of the age of the solar system, we may be able to explain it. But at this case, we really don't know how long Titan has had an atmosphere, so we don't know if that is going to be enough to explain this uh, accounting irregularity. So while we have a very good break in this case, we cannot at this time say case is over and close. So case open for number six. So moving right along to number seven, we're still on these liquids here. And in this case, we have something really remarkable, which we're going to call the magic island. And very dramatic, you can see here in these figures, which I've put on the slide, that we have a feature which seems to not exist, and then it exists, it appears, and then it maybe is even growing bigger. Is this, what, what's going on here? Is this some kind of um, peninsula which is emerging from Titan's uh, Lygia Mare, which is one of the large polar seas? Or is it something else? Is this, um, what could it be? Could it be something on the surface? Could it be, could it be waves? Could it be bubbles? Could it be a frothy, frothy organic uh, bubble material? I mean, it looks like the, the rest of the bright material, which we think is the drier land, the icy land, but there's something that's coming and going here while the rest of the surface is not doing this disappearing act. So what is going on here? So in fact, this was a project which became a project for a graduate student, uh, Jason Hofgartner, up at uh, Cornell University, working with researchers uh, up there on the radar team. And they were able to study this in detail, and they looked uh, in their paper at seven possible hypotheses, which I'm not going to go into in all the possible details. These included things like the, the lake surface actually rising and falling, or maybe even the land could be rising and falling. I mean, we left no stone unturned in this case. And uh, Hofgartner went into this in, in real detail, and he concluded that the most likely thing is that the lake, the lake level is not rising or falling, and neither is the land, but it has to be something that's occurring in the liquid. And this could either be a floating uh, or suspended solids, or it could be some kind of bubbles, or it could be waves. Those are the most likely explanations. And based on what we see on the Earth, looking down on the Earth with radar, radar tends to see rougher material. So when we get a reflection like that, it's because the surface is rough. It's reflecting the radar back towards us. And when the surface is smooth, it appears dark because the radar is not reflected back towards us. That appears radar dark. So if we were looking at a mirror, we would see something that was radar dark. If we were looking at a very flat, unperturbed surface of a lake, we would see something that was radar dark. When we see something that's radar bright, that means we're either seeing uh, a rough surface or we could be seeing uh, rough waves on a liquid. So the most likely explanation here, something that is able to appear like that, seems to be that we're seeing some uh, waves develop. And this could be where the sea is shallower or it's uh, passing over something uh, subsurface, and this is causing uh, waves to break. So this is, uh, I put in this uh, picture here of the uh, proposed mission. This was a few years ago. This mission was called TIME, the Titan Mare Explorer. Um, this was a probe that was going to float like a boat, and it was going to uh, land on uh, one of Titan's seas and float around for several months and tell us a lot about what was going on on the surface, take pictures, measure tides, measure waves if the probe is bobbing up and down, make atmospheric measurements, and even suck in some of the lake material and do a chemical analysis. And really, we were uh, saddened that NASA didn't pick this mission, picked a, a, a different mission instead for this opportunity. But it may be that this mission will come around again and, and be proposed at a future date. So we know that this Magic Island inclusion is not exactly uh, Las Vegas magic, but we really don't know for definite what it is yet. Our best hypothesis at this point is that it's waves. Okay, well, I don't know where you're living in the U.S. Maybe you're living somewhere that's uh, very sunny all the time, and maybe it's uh, maybe you're living in Seattle. But on Titan, we have this problem of too many sunny days. So Titan, as we've said, is shrouded in a haze, but right down at the bottom of the atmosphere, there's something else, and these are clouds, and these are the clouds of the methane and ethane that form the rainfall. And in this uh, plot here, this... Uh, uh, color-coded uh, contour plot. This shows over time where we expect 
the latitudes on the planet for the rainfall to be. So you can see back in January 2004, down in the lower left-hand corner there, we expect a lot of precipitation in Titan South. And as we go through the years, as Titan undergoes this 29-and-a-half-year uh, cycle uh, going around the Sun with Saturn, that the precipitations would move into the central latitudes near the equator and then finally move into the north. But what we see is, in fact, the uh, – so that's, that's what the model says we should see. But what we see is, in fact, these black circles, these black dots. And these are indicated where we've seen clouds on Titan. And you can see there was a humongous outburst right around January 2010. Um, but the rest of the clouds have been really, really patchy and uh, hard to see. Part of this we know is an observing effect. Cassini is not observing Titan all the time. So we only get a chance maybe every uh, 30 days or so to fly by Titan and, and actually look for clouds. But even so, we're not seeing nearly as many of these clouds as we expect. And in particular, in the later stage of the mission, if you look towards the upper right here, where the orange and yellow contours are, we're seeing hardly any clouds falling on top of this. So we expect that right now, Titan should be getting really cloudy and having a lot of rainfall begin to happen in the north. And this is due to the uh, the insulation in the south. As, as the south has gone into summer, it's been driving off any uh, liquids in the south, and that these would be carried to the north and then rain and condense out on the surface. And we're just not seeing that. What is going on? Why is Titan so sunny? Why, why don't we have enough clouds? So even as we've begun to think about this problem, we saw something else strange. And this is uh, very recent. This is from June of this year, 2016. And on the left here, you can see a photograph taken by the Cassini VIMS team, the near-infrared camera, which uh, principally looks at 1 to 5 microns. So that's the infrared. And on the right here, you can see a uh, shorter wavelength image from the Cassini imaging camera team. And what we see is that we see these really bright spots appearing on the VIMS image, and we don't see anything in the imaging uh, camera image in the, in the visible. So, wh so what's going on here? How can we be seeing a cloud, a lot of clouds in the north, and yet we're not seeing them with another instrument at almost exactly the same time? And this is a really big mystery. I mean, this really has us stumped right now because, in fact, this is about the opposite of what we expect. We would expect that it might be possible to see clouds appear with the imaging cameras, but they could be um, invisible to the longer wavelengths because the particle, if the particles are small enough, they might be transparent at the longer wavelengths. But, in fact, we see something that is only seen at the longer wavelengths and not at the short, shorter wavelengths. And this is just truly perplexing to us. So in this case, we've now taken what was already a mystery of not enough clouds, and now we're seeing clouds, and at the same time, we're not seeing clouds. So there's really going to be some explanation required here. And uh, this one is definitely uh, a case open. And uh, of course, we'll be looking very intensively for clouds during the remaining one year of the Cassini mission. Okay, so we're on to case number nine, the tilted pole of Titan. So this is something. Uh, Again, really remarkable. Now, in this case, we're talking about Titan's rotation, but we're not talking about the rotation of the solid body, which is what we talked about all the way back in case number one with the wobbling pole. In this case, we're talking about the atmosphere. So <clears throat> on this slide here, what I'm showing you is contours of temperature. So we're looking on the North Pole on the left, and we're looking on the South Pole on the right. You can see here that the, uh, the South was warmer at this time, and the north was colder. This was from early in the mission, when the north was still at the end of its winter time, and the south was in its fall before it went into uh, before it went into winter. The north was just coming out into spring, so the north was still cold, and the south was um, was had not yet cooled down. And what we'd expect is that the atmosphere should be going around Titan in a symmetric way. So as we go further in latitude, it should get colder. But in fact. These, uh, what we call contours, or these uh, uh, circles or ovals of temperature, are not lined up. So the, the, uh, where the, the atmospheric pole effectively is, is not on top of where the solid body pole of Titan is. In fact, at about, uh, instead of at 90 degrees north, it's, uh, it's around uh, 86 and a half degrees north, is where the uh, atmosphere, is the point where the atmosphere is rotating around. And that's really strange. Why would that be happening? Titan is a slowly rotating 
world, and there's no reason why the atmosphere should be tipped over compared to the surface. So one theory was that this could be due to the sun, where the sun is forcing the, uh, the atmospheric pole a little bit away from the uh, solid body pole, just from the direction of the incident sunlight. And a Question. Was that, yeah, go ahead. The, the um, numbers on the bottom, are those degrees, uh, are those Kelvin? Yes, absolutely yes. Those are Kelvin, yeah. Okay, so what we find is that as we go along in the mission, we would expect that this pole, which is um, tipped away from the sun, as we begin to go around the sun, it would remain uh, in an inclination which is tipped away from the sun. In fact, guess what? It doesn't do that at all. Titan's just fooled us yet again. Titan's polar tilt of the atmosphere is staying exactly where it is as Titan goes around the sun, and it's not responding to the sun at all in any way. So it's, it looks like the atmosphere is staring at the stars while the surface is doing its own thing. So in this case, we're, uh, we, we, I was on a team, we put out a theory for this, and it turns out our theory is not working. So it's back to the drawing board and uh, case open on the, on the tilted, uh, tilted atmospheric pole. Okay, so moving right along here, case number 10, the fugitive methane. So in this case, what we find is that at the top of Titan's atmosphere, and in fact, at the top of most planetary atmospheres, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a point where the atmosphere transitions to space, and we call this the, the exobase, and anything that's above that is the exosphere, exo meaning outside. So it's outside of the gravitational of the body and those molecules can escape into space. And, you know, over time, uh, atmospheres do get eroded from the top of the atmosphere, um, from the exit base, and these can be from different processes. Um, and on Titan, we can see that there's methane and hydrogen that's escaping. But the curious thing about the methane is that the methane is really escaping, and the methane is escaping much, much faster than it should be escaping. Uh, the escape of methane should be pretty slow at the present day because Titan has presumably been around for a long time, and the very fast escape process, which would have occurred in the early solar system, have now calmed down. And in fact, what we ex what we'd expect is that um, a process called um, genes escape, um, nothing to do with your uh, blue denim pants, but uh, named after an astronomer, Sir James Genes, uh, proposed that uh, molecules which are uh, a little bit faster than other molecules, it's the fastest of the fast are the ones that are going to escape. But most of the molecules are going to stay put. And this is what we call genes escape. A very, very uh, energetic molecule is able to uh, have enough uh, velocity due to its uh, temperature that it's able to reach the escape velocity and then just cross over that exobase into space and drift away. But the, but the amount of methane that's escaping is really much, much more than that. So the two plots that I put here really just show different models compared to uh, observations of argon, 40 argon on the left, and methane on the right. And this is a little bit of a complicated story, but the bottom line is that if we can do something which works for argon, it doesn't work for methane. And if we do something that works for methane, it doesn't work for argon. So the two things should be pretty well mixed. And it's just not like that. So what's happening is that the methane is somehow uh, speeding up and escaping. So we have several possible explanations here. We have um, the methane is escaping from the atmosphere at this really, truly incredible rate of 2 times 10 to the 27 molecules per second. And if we look at the normal escape velocity method of letting, out, letting mo molecules escape, that only explains 1 times 10 to the power 19. So that's about eight orders of magnitude too little to explain how much methane is escaping. And even if we include what's called sputtering, and that means sputtering is really the solar wind coming in. The solar wind is these fast energetic particles, uh, protons, and they're bumping into molecules, and they can just bump them so that they get bumped off Titan. And the sputtering process can get you up another five orders of magnitude, but it's still you know, a thousand times too weak to explain the amount of methane escaping. And the only possible way we can explain this is by invoking something called hydrodynamic escape. And that, that literally means that the atmosphere is being heated up so much that the entire atmosphere is swelling up, just like a, you know, I don't know, a 
like a balloon being pumped up, and the atmosphere is actually actively being pumped up, and the molecules are being are being forced. The entire atmosphere is being forced through this gravitational uh, boundary of the exobase and being forced into space. And this is something that we know happens typically at the early period of a planet's formation, but we just don't expect that to be happening today. And if this is occurring, then Titan's methane can be, can be disappearing really rapidly. So this is a really perplexing mystery. And uh, at this case, we really don't know. We're, one of the things we're looking at is are all our, our, all, all our, our observations of the uh, argon and the methane, do we really understand those? And, uh, and if so, you know, we, we still have a mystery on our hands. Question. Go ahead. Would this imply that the top of Titan's atmosphere would be warmer than expected? Yeah, I mean, that implies that there's there's uh, heating going on that's uh, driving the expansion. Yeah. So that's that's the model that we have to put in place to explain the escape. So we have a mystery with uh, methane, but we also have a mystery with hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is a very small uh, light molecule. We know that hydrogen is escaping from the top of Titan's atmosphere. In fact, that, that one we can account for. But hydrogen is doing something else really bizarre. And what's happening is that hydrogen has a percentage of about 0.4% at the top of the atmosphere but only about 0.1% at the bottom of the atmosphere. <clears throat> and that implies that something is subtracting hydrogen from the bottom of the atmosphere. And when this was modeled, it appeared that the only way to explain this was that the hydrogen just seems to be just disappearing in the Titan surface, like it's just being sucked in. And uh, that, that's really surprising. There was a hypothesis, actually, that tentatively suggested that if you have certain life forms, they could take uh, meth, uh, hydrogen and acetylene and turn them back into methane. But when you add up the numbers, this really doesn't seem to, to be a good explanation. So, and even more strange is that the hydrogen is varying with latitude. So the figure that I'm showing you here just shows the variation of hydrogen with latitude. You can see that it's, um, it's peaking up the higher values over the North Pole, and then it's lower on the equator and the south. And uh, so there's something, not only is it low uh, right at the surface, but it's not the same all over Titan's surface. So one possible theory that could explain this high value in the north could be, again, due to Titan circulation. So on here you see Titan compared to the Earth. And because the Earth is a faster rotating world, we don't tend to see just a single atmospheric circulation cell where the air rises in, in the summer hemisphere and sinks in the northern hemisphere, it tends to get broken up into uh, different zones. We have an, an equatorial zone, and then we get to um, the mid-latitude zone, and then we get to the polar cells. But on Titan, because it's a slowly rotating body, that means that the uh, evaporation that occurs in the south, that enriched air flows around to the north and then uh, sinks in the north. And that's during the southern summer, northern winter, and then that would reverse. And during the period where these two things are transitioning, you have the case that you can see in the lower left, and that's where we have the sunlight on the equator, where the air is rising the equator, it's causing clouds in the equator, and then it's flowing to both poles. But in general, general, the air is going to be rising in one hemisphere and sinking in the other hemisphere. Well, that could be a potential explanation for this hydrogen case. So if we go back to our uh, previous slide here, Again, you can see the hydrogen is higher in the north hemisphere, which is on the, uh, the left-hand side here. And that could be because of the circulation, which is really pulling down air from the higher parts of the atmosphere. And as it's pulling down the air, this air, which is enriched in hydrogen, is being pulled down into the lower parts of the atmosphere. And that's enriching the lower parts of the atmosphere due to the circulation. So in this case, we may have an explanation as to why there's a little bit more hydrogen in the, in the north than in the south. We don't know why it's so low overall in the lower part of the atmosphere. This is a really major mystery. 
and uh, at this stage, it's still an unsolved uh, Titan cold case. Okay, well, I'm coming along to the last uh, case here, and I know I've been going uh, fairly quickly. There's a lot to take in. I hope you've been able to uh, get an overview here. But as we move along to our last case, we're going to look at the floating and sinking haze of Titan. So there's some really beautiful pictures here. In fact, the, the picture on the left, this is from Voyager. So this is from right back in 1980. And one of the things you can see here is that Titan is orange. So you've just got a little bit of the edge of Titan here on the uh, right-hand side of that left picture. And above the main part of the atmosphere, you can see that there's this blue haze. And this is something similar to what you would see on, on the Earth on a, on a hazy day. But then right above that, there's a gap. And then there's another haze. And there's this floating haze there. And this is floating above the main part of the atmosphere. And this is really strange. How can you have something that is separated like this? Because if you, even if you had some air that was blowing upwards, why would it not form a continuous profile? Why would it form this distinct layer? So uh, when Cassini came along, one of the things we wanted to find out was, is this layer still there? And you can see a beautiful image here from Cassini back in 2005, which shows that this beautiful detached haze layer extending from the north really a uh, substantial way around the, the disk of Titan. You can see the, the main orange haze layer and then fading, and then this beautiful detached haze layer at about 500 kilometers above the surface. But why? Do we, do we have an explanation why? Well, the, the two main theories for this could be that it's produced by either, number one, a particular chemistry, which occurs at 500 kilometers in altitude, or B, it could be due, due to a dynamical explanation. When I say dynamics, I mean winds, I mean air blowing material. So it could be that there's some kind of circulation which is drawing this material along the edge of Titan at around 500 kilometers altitude. Or it could be a mixture of both. It could be that there's chemistry and dynamics occurring. Um, but then something strange started to happen. So in fact, the haze began to, the detached haze began to sink. and I'm not kind of wishing I'd, I'd, I'd drawn some lines on this figure, but if you look here on the left-hand side, 2006, you can see that there's some red at the bottom, and then it goes blue, and there's a gap, and then you see some more kind of lighter blue and white. And that lighter blue and white towards the upper left-hand corner is the detached haze layer. And as we move through the seasons, going from left to right across that image, you can see that this um, detached haze around 2009, 2010, began, begins to bend downwards, and it eventually just blends into the main haze. So by 2012, 2013, we no longer have that gap region above the main atmosphere with the detached haze floating on top. And right now, if we were to take this right out to the present day, we would see that uh, something is happening, and it appears that the detached haze is actually reappearing again. So there's definitely something seasonal going on here on Titan with this detached haze, which is causing it. But as to how much is uh, due to the chemistry and how much is due to the dynamics, we still need to work out those details. OK, so this one is still case open. So what I've put on my uh, uh, last slide here for the main uh, presentation is, oops, I hope it's going to not freeze up on me. So I've taken the, uh, the 12 cases, which I've uh, put forth here, and we're, we're going to see which ones are closed and which ones are open. And right now we have four of our cold cases, case closed. We're very happy. And uh, in the other eight cases, the case is still open. And, I, and this gives us a score line here of uh, <laughs> Titan 8, scientists 4. Titan is still winning at the end of Cassini. But you know, the great thing is that even those cases that we call um, case closed, that doesn't mean that there's not further uh, study to be, to be done. For example, with the uh, surface ices, you know, we know that there's not water ice exposed to the surface, but we don't know what the ices are. Um, you know, with the, with the Magic Island, we think we've got an explanation, but we're not completely sure. Um, with the lakes and seas, we've got a really great explanation as to why we're seeing more lakes 
in the uh, north at the present time and not in the south. That's a really good uh, case, but we don't know why there's not more liquids on the surface of Titan uh, overall. So we're saying the science is not quitting. We have another uh, year left of Cassini. We've uh, been now in, in orbit around Saturn for uh, 12 years, and we've got another year before we uh, go into our final dramatic plunge into Saturn's atmosphere. And during this time, we have um, a couple more flybys of Titan close up, and then we have um, a lot more flybys of Titan at further distances. So we still have a lot of Titan science to do. One of the key things that we're doing in this last year of the mission is really to look for those clouds, those missing clouds, and um, see if we can um, see if we can figure out uh, are there more clouds appearing? Uh, will, will they finally line up with our models, or is this mystery going to continue? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. I'm going. I want to first of all acknowledge the other scientists on the team here who are really responsible for the science in each of these individual cases, which I presented today. And uh, I, I want to take any questions you have. And then I would like to, uh, right at the end, uh, go on and uh, show you this uh, short video we have uh, to present today. So um, thanks for your attention so far. I hope you find this interesting and intriguing. And I hope to see that there's still plenty of mystery there. So uh, go ahead and take questions. OK, yes. Um... You mentioned the, the the wobble of Titan. Now, as you know, uh, the the Earth itself uh, wobbles on its poles. Uh, are are the two uh, mechanisms uh, related? Um, that that's a really great question. Um, as far as the Earth goes, not being an Earth scientist, I'm not completely sure what the mechanisms are for that. I I know that that would be the gravitational interaction between the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. And, um, you know, on Titan, it's due to the uh, to the parent body, which is due to uh, Saturn's equatorial uh, bulge pulling on Titan, and, uh, and also due to the Sun. So I think, in general, it is the same mechanisms. The... Um, on, the on the Earth, we have these long period cycles. They're known as... Um, Kroll Milankovitch cycles, and uh, in fact, that was what inspired uh, scientist uh, Odette Aronson to uh, try and come up with a uh, explanation for the, uh, you know, for the for the Titan um, uh, polar wander. So, um, so it was by looking at the Earth that we were able to see that the same mechanisms are at work on Titan. Great. Um, another question. Um, now, you've concluded that Titan does have a water ocean. Uh, yay. Uh, would this be similar to the ocean we think is under Europa or uh, on uh, Enceladus? Okay, that, that's a really good question. So the oceans on these worlds may be similar but not identical. So one of the real questions is that when you have an ocean which is frozen by water on top, what is on the bottom of that ocean? And is it going to be ice on both sides? So you just have a layer where it's warm enough and at the right pressure to have water where it's bounded above and below by, uh, by water ice? Or is it bounded just by water ice on top, but bounded by something like rock on the bottom? And that would lead to differences in the chemistry of those oceans. So on Europa and Enceladus, the hypothesis is that they uh, are bounded on the bottom by rock. Uh, and on Titan, we believe it would be bounded on the bottom by water ice. So that would mean that there may be less of the mineralogy that we could get from the rocks going into Titan's uh, water ocean. Um, so there may be some differences. And Enceladus, of course, we know is active enough that it has these jets, it has these geysers on the South Pole. Europa, we think we're seeing some geysers, but we're not sure. Um, Titan, there's definitely no evidence of that. So I would say that there's um, a similarity and a difference in the, what's, what the chemical uh, makeup of that ocean is. Thank you very much. What, one more question. Um, uh, with regards to the, the missing hydrogen, and I presume you're talking about molecular hydrogen, H2, 
um, as as you know, on Earth, there is a, a sink for for carbon. So so a lot of carbon on the Earth is is uh, uh, physically uh, locked in in into these uh, sink areas. Would a similar mechanism be there for the hydrogen on uh, on on Titan? That is to say, could there be a large hydrogen sink where on Earth there's a large carbon sink? Well, that's a good question. So the carbon sink on the Earth is the formation of carbonate rocks, and that forms a very involatile substance in which you can uh, trap your carbon. So on, on Titan, you would have to have a chemical process where you're taking the hydrogen and binding it up into something that was heavy enough to not be volatile. So in principle, you could react the hydrogen maybe with um, an unsaturated hydrocarbon, so a hydrocarbon that doesn't have all of the uh, possible bonding positions uh, used up. That could be something like a, a polyacetylene. And, um, you know, that, you know, to me, that, that could be a plausible explanation. I don't know how much that's been looked at in detail. I mean, in general, hydrogen gas, of course, is very volatile. So unless you're able to bind it up into you know, a heavy material, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just um, mix back into the atmosphere again. So, you know, I, I, I agree with you. There could be an analogy there. It's a good question. I, I seem to be asking a lot of good questions here. <laughs> Very proven questions. Thank, thank you, yeah. Connor, it's Joe, and I have a more meta question, and I, since Cassini's flybys, as we know, are coming to an end, what do you see, if any, um, of the role, if any, of um, ground-based facilities, of um, James Webb coming online, hopefully, and other space-based observatories in possibly closing off some of these mysteries? Well, that's definitely a good question, Joe. So, you know, maybe we can do something with clouds. Uh, I'm currently involved in uh, observation planning for the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope for Titan in particular, and looking at Titan. But of course, for James Webb Telescope, despite being um, such a large and great facility, is you know a heck of a lot further away than Cassini is on Titan. That means we don't have the ability to see small clouds coming and going. If there was some kind of really big cloud outburst, we could definitely see it. And um, you know, in general, in the near infrared the overall reflectance of Titan changes by a few percent whenever there's a, a cloud outburst. So you don't even have to be able to resolve Titan from a dot to be able to know that there's clouds there. Um, uh, so as far as other observatories, uh, I also work with the ALMA telescope, which is in Chile, and is able to look at uh, molecules in Titan's atmosphere. So one of the things we'll be able to do is that even after Cassini has left, we'll be able to monitor the seasons coming and going on um, on Titan. However, some of these things, you know, are really going to require different sort of missions. So getting down to the surface, being able to tell what's the surface composition, what's the lake composition, um, you know, what are the winds doing in the lower atmosphere, what's happening with uh, hydrogen on the surface, and uh, you know, is what's in the crust? Is there uh, is the crust uh, really? Pull up like a sponge with uh, with ethane. You know we're going to need different sorts of missions to go there and do that. So, um, you know, uh, at this time, we'll be able to do a lot from the ground in terms of monitoring the seasonal change of Titan's atmosphere in particular. But I don't think we're going to learn too much about what's really going on down at the surface. So hopefully NASA will put together a mission for that. We had a question online asking if you expect more mysteries to arise towards the end of the mission. Okay, well, I should say up front that because I picked these 12 mysteries, this is not the complete list. So we're actually going to put together a complete list and write an article about this, and we're up to around 16 or 17, and this is just the ones that we've uh, 
picked out to be the most important one. So there's a lot of open questions. Um, we have another question that's uh, a big question right now, but why Titan isn't trailing around a trail of nitrogen atoms behind it as it goes around Saturn. And uh, that's something that's been looked for and hasn't really been understood either because Titan's atmosphere, despite having a lot of methane, a couple of percent, it's mostly 98% um, uh, nitrogen, which is fairly inert. But even so, the nitrogen can be uh, lost from the top of the atmosphere and should be trailing around Titan. So there are other questions there. Um, you could talk about questions about Titan's potential for astrobiology, for life. Uh, is there anything that could be habitable or inhabiting the, the lakes and seas or the interior? Uh, there's really big questions about how old really is Titan. We've talked a lot about Titan being four and a half billion years old, but is it really that old? Did it form more recently? Um, the Saturn system in some ways is very strange. Saturn has these big, bright, icy rings. And the other planets that have ring systems, such as Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, don't have these big, bright, icy rings. They tend to have very faint, dusty uh, rings, which are not at all the same. And in fact, the expectation is these icy rings probably don't last that long, maybe only 100 million years or so. There seems to be some kind of transient event in the Saturn system that may have created the rings. It may have even, for all we know, created Titan from other moons that got banged up and joined together. So there's really big open questions at this time as to, uh, you know, was, was there some catastrophe in the Saturn system? Or maybe it was the fact that Titan was there for a long time, but for most of its period, uh, for most of its history, it didn't have an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a more recent uh, occurrence, which happened with maybe something happened in the interior. It cooled to a certain point where there was a, uh, a new uh, state, of, state of matter formed, and this caused some kind of overturning, which led to an outburst of atmospheric gases. And that therefore, the atmosphere is fairly recent. So, I mean, there's really big open questions right now. And, uh, you know, it's going to take all of our all of our wits and all of our ingenuity to really try and crack these. I've got to say, if Titan formed out of uh, other moons, uh, you're talking about a lot of other moons. Yeah, so there's an interesting theory on that, which is that if you look at the Jupiter system, you see that Jupiter has four moons that are about the same size. They're all pretty big. And uh, then, if well, let's say they're medium-sized moons. Then if you look at the Uranus system, you also see that Uranus has about four kind of medium-sized moons. They're not as big as the Galilean moons, but if you ratio the moons of Uranus to the size of Uranus, you get about the same proportion as you get taking those four big moons of Jupiter to the size of Jupiter. Then you come to Saturn, and what you expect is that where Titan is, there should be four medium-sized moons, and instead you see one really big moon. So, you know, there's kind of like there's some questions there. I have a question about um, slide 40, the one where you scored it. Titan 8, minus 4. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, if you're looking at that slide, I've been trying to... Um, because it's my personality to get a one-for-one -one relationship between these 12 and the titles that you gave them in the slides. And I think I've matched them up. I think case two, which says what's hiding inside, is actually rigor mortis. Uh, absolutely, yes. And that's you show it here as open, but in the slides you showed it as closed, whereas the magic island underneath it you show as open in the previous slide, and here you show it as closed. I think the labels are reversed on those two, open and closed. No, you may be right about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think and you're right. I just want to make sure I was matching the right words with the, because you used different words for the title slide. I'm very glad you're checking up on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you if you spot anything like that, please let me know. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure those are changed online for the final version. Any other questions for our speaker? Regarding the fugitive methane, um, just made me wonder how well quantified is the dissociation of methane high in Titan's atmosphere? Well, that's pretty well understood. So we know the solar flux. So we know how much ultraviolet light is coming from the sun, and that causes a um, it's basically, you can give or take the solar cycle, but over very long periods of millions of years, the sun has a 
you know, a fairly steady average output, and that means that the amount of methane that's being depleted is at a certain rate. And we can literally just take um, any UV photon, which is shorter than the uh, wavelength, or in other words, has enough energy to break apart methane, and just add up all those photons. So in particular, it's the uh, Lyman alpha flux of, of the sun um, caused, caused by hydrogen in the sun, which produces, uh, I think it's around 121 nanometers light, and that's just the principal dominant flux, which is, which is uh, coming along and uh, initially breaking up the methane. Then something else happens. Once you break up methane, you create this radical C2H, which is um, a little bit like acetylene, but it's, a, it's a acetylene with the hydrogen removed. And this is called the ethanol radical. And then this becomes like this predatory molecule that can just go and destroy methane, just kind of like a rampaging you know, a bull in a, in a china shop. And this causes a much faster depletion of methane. But we also understand pretty well, we believe, uh, about that reaction rate. So we believe that we've got a fairly good handle on how fast the methane is being, is being destroyed. And we know how much methane is there. So if we take those two things together, we believe that the methane is only going to last anywhere from 10 to 30 million years. You can maybe stretch it to 100 million years, but you know it's not going to go beyond that, unless you're generating it from the inside. Uh, hi, I've got uh, one more question. Uh, talking about the, uh, the various types of mass loss that Titan may be undergoing, uh, running the time machine backwards, how much bigger was it when it finally condensed uh, around Saturn? Uh, how much more massive was it as compared to today? Let me see if I understand your question. So you're saying if we run this backwards and the methane is being depleted, Right, how much methane, more, whatever. Right, how, how much bigger was it uh, way back when? So you're talking about the the atmosphere of Titan so being being bigger. The atmosphere, than the or or even the mass of uh, uh, the moon itself, since uh, uh, that seems to be a large part of its uh, uh, what makes it up. Uh, you know, how much heavier was it? Well, the atmosphere would be a very very small fraction of the overall mass of the of the moon itself. So. I don't think the actual mass of Titan would have changed very much, but the size of the atmosphere, you know, which is really much less, could have substantially changed. So there's a couple of clues about that. So one is the fact of this methane being depleted, and we could run this backwards and say, okay, there had, there had to have been, um, you know, 100 times more methane in the past. Um, there's also an interesting clue with nitrogen, which is that um, nitrogen comes in two main isotopes. There's 14 nitrogen and 15 nitrogen. And uh, the amount of 15 nitrogen that we have on Titan appears to be higher than we would expect at the time of formation. What this may mean is that during the early times of Titan's history, some of the lighter isotope, the 14 nitrogen, was, was preferentially um, escaped from Titan. And it may be that by modeling that in detail, and there's been attempts to do this, we could actually backtrack and say how long in the past would it have been that the um, 14 to 15 nitrogen was exactly the way we would we would expect it. So something like the you know the giant planets, um, but right now it's it's enriched, which is what we see on places like um, on Mars, where we know for a fact that there's been a lot of atmospheric mass loss. So yes, we believe that Titan's atmosphere was more massive in the past. Uh, just stretching my my memory here, I think there was suggestions that maybe two to ten times more massive the atmosphere in the past. Okay, thank you. It's on the nitrogen, yeah. Any other questions for our speaker? So now we have a bonus extra from Connor, which he will describe. Okay, so something a little bit different here, but still on the general theme of Titan, and I hope you'll find this uh, somewhat uh, entertaining. So uh, over the, a couple of years ago, uh, at, at where I work in NASA Goddard, we have a a big intake of summer interns, a couple of hundred interns come here in the summer, and a project that I uh, dreamed up to keep them occupied as well as actually doing the science, which they're meant to be doing, was to do a fun, uh, fun project and make a little movie about Titan. So the inspiration from this came from just doing like a travel commercial for Titan. Like you're taking a, taking a vacation to Titan, what would it be like to actually go there? And we called this uh, Titan Tours. And in addition to making this movie, we didn't just make it in a regular um, 2D uh, format. We actually made it in a 
kind of a pseudo 3D format. So we made this for Science on a Sphere, and I don't know if any of you may have come across this or not. You can um, perhaps shout out if you have, but it's a, uh, it's a spherical uh, movie projection, and uh, you can see here, this is, this is like a six-foot globe, which generally uh, hangs from the ceiling in an auditorium. It can be in a museum, it can be in a school, it can be in, uh, in somewhere else, and we can project uh, images. It was originally devised by NOAA, um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, to show weather, weather on the Earth, weather on the Earth's globe, ocean currents and things like that. And there's some really incredible uh, movies if you ever get to see those in one of your local science centers. But there's been a move recently to do some planetary science versions of this as well. And this is the medium we decided to use, was to see what would it be like to put Titan on a sphere and to make our movie in this format. So you can see here we have a combination of projections of Titan uh, onto the surface. And then on top of that, we were able to put some kind of letterbox style uh, pictures which would show people talking about uh, Titan. Uh, here, here's the ship's captain showing the arrival at Titan. And uh, so the overall uh, goal here was to make something that could be used for outreach purposes to give maybe a bit of visibility to Cassini, but also to the science that's coming out for Titan in general, and to make sure that some of the science uh, didn't just get lost in scientific journals, but was able to reach out to the, you know, to the public or uh, uh, K through 12, uh, or, or other people who might be interested to see this in a science museum, and to do it in a in a fun uh, way that might create some memorable uh, learning moments. So here I have uh, pictures of some of the interns involved in the project. These are all, uh, you know, really great uh, young adults who were, were at NASA, and they really got into this. They helped devise these shirts, uh, the logo we had, and we had uh, five. Uh, student actors who, who uh, you know, acted out different scenes on the surface. On the on the left here, we have uh, beside a crater. In the center, we have on the sand dunes, and on the right hand side side we have the dry seabeds, which are near the equator, which in fact is where Cassini uh, landed a small probe called Huygens on the surface. And we envisaged that maybe one day there'd be a museum here that you could come visit. Uh, we have to uh, take a little bit of artistic license here. We did away with the spacesuits and helmets for some practical reasons. So you have to imagine that our, our, uh, our actors are, are safe, inside a, safe inside a bubble here, but uh, they're, they're on the spot reporters telling you what it would be like. And in each of these locations, we basically describe very briefly what, what you're seeing, and then there's uh, kind of a fun activity. You know, you could go uh, take a balloon flight over a crater, or you could go and ride a dune buggy over the dunes. And the idea here is to convey the science so that people will remember, oh my goodness, we could ride a dune buggy and then they're going to remember dune fields. Or in another example, here we have an ice volcano. Hey, we could go skiing and we're going to try and combine the visual aspects of that with the learning aspects so that people remember these uh, key different terrains or, or different topographies uh, on Titan. Okay, so let's see. So we, we did our initial filming in summer of 2014. And then we had a bit of a hiatus while we waited to uh, get the rest of the production done. And you can see uh, myself here in the right-hand figure with the skis, <clears throat> uh, a couple of the actors, uh, and they're surrounding the uh, lady in the pink shirt who was our uh, actual acting coach. She's not in the movie, but she was uh, one of our administrative assistants who does amateur theater, and she was really great. She helped us out with the acting coach and uh, two of the other actors are here. And then on the left-hand side, we have our ship's captain, who's a real-life uh, ex-astronaut. He's one of our high-profile scientist astronauts here at NASA Goddard. His name is Peter Sellers, and he's very active in promoting uh, Earth global warming science. So we finally, in summer of 2016, we were able to get another student intern, this time not as an actor, but actually as a production assistant. And this production assistant added the sound effects, uh, put everything together, added the, the musical score, which is uh, rather amusing. Uh, out of the credits, and did some of the, uh, finished up the animation work and got it ready for the overall uh, release. And the 3D version, and I'm calling it a 3D version. It's really it's really a 2D sphere version. Came out on the International Observe the Moon Night, which was a couple of weeks ago in early October, and we had a big crowd here at NASA Goddard. About I think it was around three or four hundred people. Even though it was a, ra uh, a rainy, cloudy night, 
and we weren't going to get to see the moon. People come out anyway, and we had a lot of activities. And as one of the activities, not just the Earth's moon, we featured other moons in the solar system. And in our spherical uh, sphere auditorium, we showed this movie and did a, did a nice premiere, and we had one or two of the actors were able to come back for that. And But because we realized that we weren't going to get the widest possible audience just having this particular medium, we also wanted to go back to the 2D version, by which I mean a rectangular version. So this movie was then recut and was put onto uh, YouTube. So you're able to go and, and hopefully click on that link. If the link doesn't work, I think you would be able to just go and uh, uh, do a search on YouTube for uh, uh, Titan Tours, GSFC, or Goddard Space Flight Center, and that link should come right up as one of the top hits. And since this was put online a little over a week ago, I think we're over 6,000 views. So we've really, without doing any advertising at all, I mean, today is really the first time we're actually talking about this uh, YouTube version in public to you guys. So you're the you're the official uh, <laughs> release audience for this. But we've had it up uh, in clandestine for, for a, about a week or so. And uh, we've got some views already. So um, I think given the time that we have here, we're, we're almost out of time. We may not have time have you guys click on the YouTube link and then come back and ask me questions because we're really close to the end of time. So at this point, maybe I should just ask if you have any questions about this and just uh, hope and encourage that all of you will go and have a look. And if you find it uh, a good product, maybe you'll show it to some of your classrooms or your friends and family or just be amused yourself. I should also add there is a link to this now on the on the Charm webpage. And thanks to Joe and Enrico for putting that up. Any questions? I'd like to thank our speaker again, Connor. That was a really marvelous summing up. And for those of us who are in the room here at JPL who saw the workshop at the PSG, this this really is a great representation of the entire thing in only under an hour and a half. OK, it was, it was going pretty fast, but I think it's a lot of it's there, yeah. For those who are still online, our next Charm Telecon will be on Tuesday, January 24th. And right now, it looks like it's going to be something extraordinarily interesting about Enceladus. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. And we will have eventually a recording and a transcript of the entire presentation up online if you would like to share this with other people who might have missed the presentation live. Thanks all again. Yeah, thanks again for me. Thanks, everyone, for dialing in. Thanks. Great presentation. Yeah. Recording has paused.